Dear brothers and sisters, dear viewers, welcome to our Friday night meeting again via the social media uh, with this video that is presented to you. As you know, Friday nights we're getting together. Although we cannot gather in a building, but we are here together in the virtual space and we thank God for the facility that we can use to produce these messages and programs and to bring to your attention for your blessing. The pastor asked me to share a word with you and uh, I'm going to hope and try to be able to uh, do it as briefly as possible. <clears throat> Obviously, uh, we're living in very interesting times. Uh, this year, as you know, it started uh, with a very uh, catastrophic change to the world order. Uh, in many aspects, I think we're living in uh, a period of time in history we've never experienced anything like this before. Uh, almost six months ago, probably to the date, six months ago, we were faced with a, uh, a crisis in the world, a global crisis named COVID-19. And uh, you all remember, you remember and you know what happened in March of last uh, this year when we had to isolate ourselves, uh, there were major lockdowns, there were uh, stoppage of work, schools had to shut down, literally everything came to a standstill. And uh, it's been six months that we're in this position. Uh, obviously, slowly things have uh, come back a little bit to more normal, some relaxation has been allowed and now we see that there is a second wave potentially that is coming uh, along the way and uh, we all have to face again a number of very careful precautionary um, uh, things that we need to do in order to protect ourselves and protect one another from further uh, contamination and perhaps uh, problems with this particular virus. So, it's not been an easy year. It's not been a very pleasant year. It hasn't been fun at all. Uh, many of us were hoping to be able to be free to uh, go here and there, to travel, to spend time with family and friends, and we had to always be very careful. I don't want to get into that tonight. I just wanted to say where we are. And of course, now, as we're entering the fall season, uh, we have other issues to deal with. Uh, I think the world is a very different world this year. I think we turned a page in the world history, just like there were times in history where uh, one day it was this way and the next day the world changed. Uh, I think we have come to a point where a chapter has been uh, started, a new chapter, and uh, not only the matter of the COVID-19 and Corona, I think even in many other arenas, uh, some major things are happening. And uh, I don't know whether you want to call it the uh, adjustment time in history or you want to call it the end times in history. Of course, the Bible calls it the end times. Uh, I can't tell you definitively when Jesus is coming back, but all of these things are pointing to a very imminent, in my opinion, imminent time that we will have to face uh, realities that some of them are beyond our control. We can't do anything about it because we have to do it, otherwise there's no other option. And then realities that we have to face in our personal, individual, family lives as well. You know today the poli political environment is so uh, poison, so hostile, parties are fighting each other, uh, people of a country are fractured, half are on this side, half are on the other side. They're fighting over what it seems to be uh, policies and what in reality it is only uh, self-interest that people are trying to promote on this side or that side. Uh, we have regional conflicts today. Uh, more than any other time we see uh, the news, as Jesus said, of wars and the rumors of war, and we see it today. Uh, major wars have started. What we thought may be a quiet area, now it's exploded in uh, conflicts, particularly in the Middle East and even some other countries in the world. It is a 
like a pot boiling. It is getting to the boiling point. Uh, maybe I'll use this uh, analogy. We're getting to the boiling point. It's kind of getting ready. The temperature is going up. The temperature is going up. It's coming to a boiling point. And I think every one of you in your heart, you know that we're very getting very close to that boiling point where things are now going to get out of hand. The boiling point is going to create a lot of steam and burning, heat, and maybe even an explosion in history where humanity will have to face literally possibility of extinction, possibility of annihilation of each other, possibility of collapse in the economy. Everything is on the table, as the saying goes. It used to be that we were kind of uh, secure in one aspect of our lives and maybe insecure, but today I think and I feel that everyone else would agree we're insecure in everything. There's nothing that we can say is working well, nothing that we can say is stable, nothing that we can say is permanent. So we're living in these times and the Bible had predicted that such a time will come where the world is going to rapidly in a very short span of time move to the boiling point. And I can sense that boiling happening in our individual, family, uh, corporate lives, as well as our nations, wherever we are, wherever we happen to live. My message tonight is not really to chase the news and try to pick news and say, well, look, here's a war between this country and this country. So this is part of the prophecy in this part of the Bible or that part of the Bible or here's something that's happening here so this must have been predicted in the Bible perhaps they are and uh, perhaps we'll find more prophecies to be fulfilled but you know what as a Christian my concern uh, notwithstanding what I can see around myself is to see are we ready for the coming of the Lord I think that is the message of the church and the mandate of the church. The church is not here to interpret the news or try to make sense out of the news and try to be a commentary on the news. That's not the job of the church. The church, in light of what is happening out there, the church has a mandate to uh, provide an environment as a corporate body to prepare everyone through the working of the Holy Spirit to be ready for the coming of the Lord Jesus. The Holy Spirit is here to prepare a body of believers who are ready for the Lord Jesus. They want to rule and reign with Jesus. They want to be the victorious ones with the Lord Jesus. We call them sometimes by the term the remnant. In other words, within the majority of God's people, there's always that sliver of minority that stand faithful, stand determined, stand focused, and they know why the Lord has saved them. They know why the Lord has called them. They know what they need to be, and they are yielding, they're surrendering to the work of the Holy Spirit so the Holy Spirit can individually and collectively prepare a church worthy of the Lord Jesus. Now, having said that, <clears throat> I remember in the recent months, maybe in the last one year, I don't remember the exact date, I uh, preached a message about uh, the book of Nehemiah. Uh, I think the message was the joy of the Lord. And uh, the, the theme was that in Nehemiah, it says the joy of the Lord is our strength. And I talked about that. I'm not going to go there. You can perhaps go to the archives and find that sermon. But more and more that I'm looking at the condition of the world today and the parallel of that in the Old Testament, obviously we have to take the Old Testament very seriously. The Old Testament tells us what happened in the old dispensation, which will repeat itself in the new dispensation. In the old dispensation, God took a people, <clears throat> he worked with these people, he wanted these people to be someone to represent him, to manifest his character. So he did everything he could 
by the particular ways of that period, that dispensation, and uh, obviously uh, the majority of them failed to respond to God, to submit to God, to cooperate with God, so they, they failed. But there was a minority, a remnant in the Old Testament that made it all the way through to the very end of that period. Now, when we come to the Bible, your Bible and my Bible is the same. We see that our Bible is split into two parts. There is the Old Testament that ends in the book of Malachi, and then the New Testament starts with the Gospel of Matthew. Now, the question is, how did the Old Testament end? What happened in the Old Testament? I mean, you, uh, the books in the Old Testament are not necessarily lined up chronologically. They are lined up maybe more on the side of the theology and the progression of God's speaking to humanity. So starting from Genesis, the beginnings, and then the Exodus, and then some uh, things about the new relationship that God had established with a people called Israel through Leviticus and then the journey of these people through Numbers and then the final preparation to enter the land of Canaan in Deuteronomy and then from there on we see the history and the history is uh, obviously as chronological as possible to see how these people after they left Egypt they came into the land of promise and what happened to them all the way to the time when the Babylonians came and took them captive and they took them to Babylon for 70 years. Uh, and in, in the meantime, the prophets God was sending, telling them, wake up. There's a time coming that you will be taken captive by your enemies and you will not be able to live the life that you've been living. And finally, of course, they did not listen, and finally the enemy came, the Babylonians, and took everyone into captivity. And the prophets continued to speak about what God's original intention was. And we've heard this many times, the pastor has shared this many times. God's original intention was to dwell with mankind, to have his presence in the midst of mankind, to have a representative body that would express him, within humanity and to establish his sovereignty and rule on this planet uh, through man. These are all things you've heard from the pastor in many different conferences and seminars we've had. So when we come to the end of this particular time we call the Old Testament, we see that after the people were taken into captivity and everything in the Old Testament most likely has a parallel in the New Testament. What you see in the Old Testament being physical, in the New Testament is spiritual. What you see in the Old Testament temporary, you see in the New Testament permanent and eternal. What you see in the Old Testament superficial, you would see in the New Testament a deeper thing. What you see in the Old Testament as far as a, a, a scene, you'll see in the New Testament unseen. But the principles are the same. So, in the Old Testament, uh, people of God under the Old Covenant fail. God brings out a remnant. No, in the New Testament, we have the majority of God's people failing. Let no one deceive you and tell you that the church at large is succeeding. The church at large is failing. Now, on the surface, they might be doing extremely well because they have their grip on the politics, they have their grip on social issues, they may be extremely affluent because there's many people contributing to the church treasury. These are all sounding interesting, looking fascinating, and yet that's not how Jesus measures and judges the churches. Evidenced by the fact that the seventh church of Revelation, Laodicean church, was exactly like our church today, the North American, the uh, uh, Western church where that claims to have everything, done everything, uh, and all these credits that it takes to it upon itself. And yet Jesus said, that's not how I look at you. I see you as poor, uh, naked, wretched, and miserable, and you're not really what you think you are. 
And I think when the Lord looks at the church today, he says with a broken heart that this, you are not what you think you are. You are not in my eyes, the church that I gave my life for it. You have deviated from being the church that I always wanted to uh, have as an, a representation of me, a body for me that I may dwell and I may live and I may act through this church. There is no doubt in my mind and many people today that the church has failed and God is calling from within the church a minority, a remnant who will be standing at the time of the Lord's return. So in the Old Testament, we come to that point at that apex, that at, at that point where God needs to do something in preparation for the coming of the Lord Jesus. You see, Jesus could not have appeared 2,000 years ago unless the conditions were properly set up for his appearance. So what were these conditions? <clears throat> well, there were many problems that the people of Israel, the Jews, were facing at that time. And two books that literally speak of these two problems are the book of Ezra and the book of Nehemiah. I have spoken about this in my previous, I think, uh, sermon on joy of the Lord is our strength. But I want to focus more on Nehemiah today, even though I may make, make mentions to Ezra. There were three things that when the Babylonians came to uh, invade and take the Jews captive, three things happened. They destroyed the altar on which the sacrifices and all the rituals were performed. The second thing, they destroyed the temple. So there was no physical place for the Jews to practice their faith by the Levitical and the priesthood ordinances. And the third thing was they just captured the city and burned all the walls down and it became a defenseless city. It could no longer defend itself. And in the old times, every city was identified by the walls that it had and the protection and the security of the city, the sovereignty of the the, the, the city king was based on how secure the city was as far as the walls were concerned. Three things were destroyed. And I want to submit to you that the enemy has destroyed the three very principal foundations of the church of Jesus Christ, or at least severely damaged it, that does need to be uh, examined and re needs reconsideration. As in the book of Haggai, Haggai tells the people, consider your ways or reconsider your ways. Well, what are these three things in the New Testament terminology? So we have the altar. The altar represents the centrality of the cross of the Lord Jesus. You see, the altar was the center of the life of people of Israel because on that altar, sacrifices were uh, done. Uh, sacrifice for sin, the burnt offerings, the peace offerings, the trespass offerings, all the offerings were done on the altar. And the altar in the New Testament, we know it represents the cross of the Lord Jesus. God has established in his mind and for his church and for his people, the central point, the focal point of, of our life is the cross of the Lord Jesus. That cross is not just a redemptive instrument, which it is, but it's also a restorative instrument. In other words, the cross of the Lord Jesus not only represents the forgiveness of sins that we have received by the shedding of the blood of the Lord Jesus, but also it's an instrument of restoring us back to the point of being conformed to the image and the likeness of Christ in character to be transformed, to look like Jesus, to speak like Jesus, to act like Jesus. And that instrument that performs that transformation and that restoration is the cross. Now, why am I saying that? Why would I want to bother with that? Because I feel today the church has forgotten and has lost sight of the centrality of the cross of the Lord Jesus. We've, we talk about many things in the churches today. 
We talk about psychology. We talk about sociology. We talk about family. We talk about all kinds of social issues coded with Christian jargons. We talk about abuse, but in a Christian jargon. We talk about family problems in a Christian context. Everything is a Christian context, but there is no mention anymore. Very rarely, hardly, the preachers stand there and bring conviction to the hearts of men and women, like what happened 100, 150 years ago when the preachers would preach about the cross of the Lord Jesus and people would fall down on their faces and they would repent of their sins or they would surrender their lives to the Lord Jesus. Today, we want to hear a gospel that makes us feel good, makes us smile, a gospel mixed with a few jokes, uh, a gospel mixed with some uh, very smartly produced videos, uh, presentations, amazing presentations, stage shows, singing, amazing performances. None of them are bad. But I'm saying if they have replaced the central core of the gospel, then there is a, a fundamental problem in the church today. And I don't know why our pastors or preachers are oblivious to this. Why have they forgotten that the message of the church, as Paul says in the first Corinthians, I preach Christ and him crucified for me, for I, the, the world was crucified to me and I have been crucified to the world. That centrality has been lost. The church today literally almost is without a cross in its message. It's a crossless Christianity. And whenever you take the cross out of the, the core of Christianity, you turn Christianity into something that is totally unchristian. Sounds like it, smells like it, but it's fake. It is not the real thing. So the enemy had come and they had destroyed the altar. Why would the Babylonians destroy the altar? They could have just taken people captive. But you see, the enemy was very smart. The enemy wanted to make sure that the Jews would never, ever again be able to, even when returning, come and do anything at that altar because that altar was completely destroyed. Now, of course, we know in the book of Ezra, uh, he came, a priest, and he uh, repaired the altar and began offering the regular sacrifices. And the second thing that happened was... Uh, that destroyed the temple. Now, if the altar represents the cross of the Lord Jesus and the centrality of the Lordship of Jesus in our lives, the cross says Jesus is our Lord. Jesus stands right at the center of our lives. Nothing can be done unless the sovereignty of the Lord Jesus and his dominion and his total and absolute Lordship is declared. Then we come to the, the building that contains this altar with this theme. And of course, that was the temple in the old times. In the uh, New Testament times, we don't have a building. We don't go to a building and call that a temple or cathedral. These are all human uh, creations. In the New Testament, the temple is the body of Christ, the church of Jesus Christ, that heavenly home that heavenly creation, that new creation that the Lord established by His blood, purchasing the raw material and then fitting, to, fitting them together by the guidance and the management of the Holy Spirit. So the temple was destroyed, meaning what? It meant that the people of God no longer had a heavenly model of where God's presence, where God's ordinance was, how God thought about himself in relation to his people. And today, that has been also severely damaged. What is the equivalent of in the New Testament? Well, the equivalent is the corporate mindedness of God's people. God always wanted in the middle of the city of Jerusalem for everyone from any direction you would look, you would see one thing. You would see that magnificent building and right in the center of that building would be the altar, but you would see the building. You see, the central focus of every believer 
no matter where you are in your life, when you look, you have to see the fact that your life is not your own. You are not living on your own, by your own, for yourself. You are living as a part of a collection of people, a collective that has the Lord Jesus and his cross at the center of our lives and that corporate mindedness, not just a human corporate mindedness, because that temple represented a heavenly principle. It represented what God saw his people from the heavenly perspective. And today when God looks at us, as Peter says, you are the stones, the living stones that are brought together to be fitted into a building, becoming a, a temple for praise and the worship of the Lord Jesus. The heavenliness of the church, meaning the church is not governed as a democracy. The church is not governed on the basis of human constitutions the, uh, or writing regulations. The church is not governed because a committee sits and makes decisions. The church is not governed because we have ideas as to how to make it marketable uh, or make it interesting or make it attractive. These all have to be secondary and subservient to the main principle of the church and that is the church is a spiritual a heavenly being, alive, dynamic, active on this planet in a very hostile environment where every life is against this one particular life because the life in the church is a different life than the life out there. The church is a living organism made up of cells or members that all share one life and that is a resurrected, a glorified, a heavenly eternal life out there every life is a life that smells tastes and ultimately ends in death the only place life the life exists is in this collective called the church and if we as believers think and assume that we can live our life of faith apart from this collective mindset then we are greatly mistaken and we will bear the consequences of it. So the enemy had destroyed the temple. So the people had returned to Jerusalem, but they had no altar and they had no temple. How could you be a people of God when you don't have an altar for declaring the sovereignty of the Lord? How could you not have a temple where you testify of the collectiveness and the heavenly nature of the people of God. Well, they were gone. And the third thing, of course, were the walls. So in the Old Testament, the walls symbolize defense, symbolize protection and security, and also testified of the sovereignty of the king who lived in that city. As a matter of fact, when you go to the Psalms of Degrees, I think it's in Psalm 122, if I'm not mistaken, or 123. Uh, this pilgrim of ours, which starts from 120, when he arrives in Jerusalem, he sees the city of Jerusalem, perhaps for the first time, or as a reminder. And he says in the psalm, uh, Jerusalem is a city packed with homes. These homes are all connected to each other. I don't know if you've seen some pictures of some of these little towns and cities in Europe or in, in the Middle East. They're all tightly connected together. They don't have these huge estate mansions. You know, you've seen pictures, particularly in Italy, there are these little towns built on the hills, like Portofino, like some other towns. Tightly, these homes are on top of each other, and they present a beautiful uh, picture of the collectiveness of that little town. Same in the Middle East, you would see these uh, cities. So, what is that saying to you? That we collectively live together and then of course in the old times they put, put the walls around it and that city would be a kingdom unto its own. Well today, Jerusalem is no longer a city that is what God is after. The city of Jerusalem has already outlived its historical and spiritual importance. As far as God is concerned, it doesn't matter what you call that city, you call it 
uh, Jerusalem or you call it Timbuktu as far as God is concerned. That city is not where he is concerned. Even though prophetically, historically, there are going to be things that will happen in that city. But as far as God is concerned, we're living in the era of spiritual, heavenly, invisible realities and truth. So God looks at the church and he sees the church as the Jerusalem, as the new Jerusalem, because our destiny eventually in the book of Revelation, the last chapter says, and I saw the bride of uh, Christ, the lamb, descending, and that was the heavenly Jerusalem. So the earthly Jerusalem has already outlived, done its service by bringing Christ to the world in the old covenant. Now God is reconstructing a heavenly Jerusalem that you and I are a part of that heavenly Jerusalem. We are forming that heavenly Jerusalem, but from a spiritual perspective, the enemy has done a super, super job of invading the church. Over the last few hundred years, if I am bold to say, slowly and gradually the enemy has crept in, penetrated the church very slowly, very carefully, and from within and from without, the church has been under assault, particularly in the last 100 years and specifically the last 50 years, and we see horrendous damages done to the walls. In this case, we don't have physical walls, the walls of the testimony of the church. The church has lost its testimony. The church has become a matter of ridicule. Uh, same way that at the time of Nehemiah, people would ridiculing Nehemiah, making fun of Nehemiah for attempting to build the walls of Jerusalem, a city that was an open door for anyone and everyone to come in and to go out. Thieves would come in and invade and assault people. There would be all kinds of foreigners that were not part of the people of God would come in and make all kinds of uh, unfair trades. There would be usury, there would be uh, deals that uh, exchangers would do all kinds of activities. The city of, city of Jerusalem was no longer the city of David. And today, the church is no longer the church of Jesus Christ, the visible church. It has become a den of robbers. It has become an open door. Anyone can come in and bring an idea, do whatever they want to do. Everyone can say, well, this is how I like it. This is what I'm going to do. And uh, the centrality of the cross is gone. The corporateness and the heavenly nature of the church is no longer realized and experienced. And no, the church has no longer a testimony in the world, it is no longer a barrier from the world to try to penetrate in and to poison and to pollute the quality and the life of the church and the citizens of this city. It's pretty sad. Well, this, this is how sad it was during the time of Nehemiah. Why did I bring this thing up? Because Nehemiah is God's last effort to make sure that everything was made ready for the return of the Lord, or for the appearance of the Lord Jesus, for his first coming. Historically, Nehemiah is the last book because it is closest to the time of the birth of Christ. Even though Malachi is the last prophet, but Nehemiah was not a prophet. Nehemiah was a leader. He is the last of the men in the history of the Old Testament that stood for something, did something, and achieved something for the Lord Jesus to finally appear 2,000 years ago. And I believe we are in the times that the Lord is raising not an individual Nehemiah, but a corporate Nehemiah, a collective Nehemiah who will stand and who will prepare the grounds, this time not the first appearance, but the second appearance of the Lord Jesus. This time not for the birth of the baby Jesus in the manger of Bethlehem, but this time in the triumphant return of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So it is very important that we as Christians not focus so much on these sensational news out there, even though we listen, we 
follow, but not get caught in the sensational news of the world out there because we know it will happen. We're coming to the boiling point. The boiling point is upon us, my brothers and sisters. You see the wars, you see the economic collapse, you see the health crisis, you see the social fabric change. Everything is pointing in the direction of a new world order that must come, otherwise we will not survive. And we as Christians, as the children of God, need to focus on how the end times in the old covenant was brought to conclusion. How do we, if the Lord comes in our lifetime, should bring ourselves and all brothers and sisters that have an ear to hear to that preparation for the appearance of the Lord Jesus. Last few minutes, I want to share something from the book of Nehemiah. There's a lot to share. Maybe I will take some time over the next few sessions and share more with you on the book of Nehemiah. But let me start with this. In the book of Nehemiah, when you go and read, and perhaps some of our young people or people who are interested, they should go and explore what I will share with you and find the exact spots where these points are brought to you because I'm not going to name you the verses or where they're found but I'll tell you what they were go and find them now the book of Nehemiah starts with this it starts with Nehemiah being in the court of the king of Persia king of Persia at that time the Persian Empire was the absolute power over most of the world of that time. They reigned from India to Egypt, from uh, north of Turkey down all the way to Ethiopia and Egypt. So they, they had a huge chunk of the civilized world of that time under their control. And the king of Persia in his capital city uh, was the absolute sovereign. Now, who is Nehemiah? Nehemiah is just an ordinary Jew who is in the court of the king of Persia. He's probably one of the captives of the Babylonian captivity. And, you know, when Cyrus, the king of Persia, freed uh, the people of uh, captivity, some people returned and some people remain in the Persian Empire, including our dear friend Nehemiah. He stayed there and eventually, for some reason, they hired him as the wine bearer or today's word is called bartender. He was a bartender. He just mixed drinks for the king of Persia. In the old times, they wouldn't mix drinks. They'd just have a uh, container of wine. And every anytime the, the king was thirsty, he had this probably gold uh, cup and he would just hold it like that. And he had to be just nearby on a standby. Immediately he would pour the wine into the cup and the king of Persia would drink and be merry. So that's all he does. Day in, day out, from morning to evening, he is by the king's side. Wherever the king goes, he's going after him. And as soon as the king wishes to have a cup of wine, he's got the cup in his hand, pours the wine and gives it to the king. That's all he does. Day in, day out. So <clears throat> sometimes in our lives, we do something repeatedly, tediously, day in, day out, day in, they are. And we don't know why we're doing this. Some of us are going to work every day, or we are a housewife, or we're a student. We're just doing things every day. And we think, okay, so what? I mean, what's the big deal? Well, wait a minute. In that time that you're doing something repeatedly and out of habit, and you don't think there is any significance to you, and maybe from a worldly standard, there is not much significance to any one of us. None of us have won the Nobel Peace Prize or Scientific Prize or, you know, we're not a billionaire. You know, we're just ordinary people. <clears throat> but wait a minute. Here's very interesting. That relationship that Nehemiah had with the king of Persia had established such intimacy between the two of them that they kind of knew each other well enough that when Nehemiah would see the face of the king of Persia and he was kind of thirsty or not happy, he would just go in and pour the wine and say, you know what, master, don't worry, have some wine, you'll be okay. Or we reread in the book of Nehemiah that the king of Persia realized 
something on Nehemiah's face when something happened to Nehemiah. And Nehemiah so beautifully at the end of that first chapter says, I was the wine bearer for the king of Persia. You know, that one little sentence caught me off guard. Nehemiah is such a simple, transparent, humble man that whatever happens in that chapter, at the end, he just concludes by saying, I was the cup bearer or the wine bearer of the king of Persia. Wow, what does that mean? Well, the stories in the beginning, when Nehemiah was in the court of the king of Persia, one day, one of the uh, brothers, Hananiah, from Jerusalem came over to the capital of Persian Empire and came to Nehemiah. Uh, could have been one of his relatives or a friend, came and said, you know, hi Nehemiah, what are you up to? So Nehemiah says, tell me what's going on in Jerusalem. And, ne and Hananiah says, wow, you don't know, man. It's terrible. It is horrifying. You know, we got Ezra and Zerubbabel came and they fixed the altar. They fixed the temple. And this thing is about 120 years span from the time they did all these repairs. And now we're at the last stage. So Han Hananiah tells uh, Nehemiah, but you know what? We have a major, major problem. Even though the altar has been restored, the temple has been rebuilt, but the walls are still in ruins. We don't have any walls. Meaning we have no identity. We have no security. We have no sovereignty. We're just a wide open field. An enemy has a field. They just comes in and comes out, does whatever they want to do. We are no longer the people of Israel. We're just a people with nothing to show for, no identity. And you read the, the text. It says that Nehemiah, when he heard this, he literally started sobbing, started crying, went into a deep sorrow, went into a deep mourning and he says for days I was crying I was fasting and he started praying to God that you know why are we like this what have we done we have done wrong to you God we have dishonored you we have not obeyed you and a beautiful prayer you would see there that Nehemiah offers to God well, I'm not going to go into all the details here, but what I want to say here is this. The king of Persia realizes there's something wrong with Nehemiah and questions Nehemiah. What's wrong, Nehemiah? Why, are, what is your, why is your face sorrowful? Why are you upset? Why are you depressed? How did the king of Persia know that? Intimate friendship and relationship with Nehemiah. You see, my brothers and sisters, if you and I have an intimate relationship with the Lord Jesus, and you know what? This corona has brought us to a point where we are one-on-one -on -one with the King. We're one-on-one -on -one in an intimate opportunity as we get to know Him. He knows us already. But the interesting thing is that the King of Persia reached out to Nehemiah and says, tell me what's wrong. The Lord wants to reach out to us and He wants to know what's in our heart. Of course He knows, but He wants us to confess it. He wants us to vocalize it. You know what? Nehemiah could have said many things when the king of Persia asked him that question, but he was only concerned about one thing. And this is really where it hurts. Because if God had come to me and asked me what is wrong, rather than putting my finger on the main problem and the focal point of my life, I would have probably said a lot of things that I want God to do for me, but I would have forgotten this one thing. Nehemiah did not. Nehemiah turned around to the king and said, how could I be at peace? How could I be able to show a smile when my people, when my people are suffering in Jerusalem? How could you and I be quiet? How could you and I be silent? How could you and I not be on our knees interceding for our people? I'm not talking about your racial people, your heritage people. I'm talking about the people that we're all of the same spirit and faith to intercede for the church. I'm going to end with this, and you may not like it. 
But do I care? No, because I have to say to you the truth. Nehemiah was a very simple man. God could have gone to the priests. God could have gone to the Levites. God could have gone to the affluent members of the city of Jerusalem. God could have gone to military soldiers and commanders and say, I want you to do something for me. Why did he not go to those people and came in the midst of this whole world in a little, uh, well, in the city, in the capital of uh, Persian Empire, finds a bartender to be the man that he is going to do something in preparation for the coming of the Lord Jesus. Isn't that kind of puzzling? Well, isn't that what God wants to do? To find a Nehemiah, not an individual, but a corporate Nehemiah, who can take the burden of the Lord upon themselves. Listen very carefully and I'll end this. God is looking for a people today that can take and carry the burden that the Lord has for his church. The key to the book of Nehemiah is in the very few first few verses. The response and the reaction of Nehemiah that when he heard the problems in Jerusalem, they were not just Jerusalem problems. They were not just the problems of the people of God. They were the problems of the Lord. They were the pain in the heart of the Lord. They were a burden uh, on, on, the, on the Lord's heart. And he took those. He said, I like to share with my God the same pain, the same burden for his people. Being a remnant church does not mean that we close an eye and we ignore and we neglect and we forget what is happening in the world of our brothers and sisters in the church. We should be concerned. Why are we standing here and preaching an un, uh, a message that is not so favorite, not so favorable, an unpopular message? I could have preached a very happy message and everybody would have said, wow, I, I feel so great. Maybe there are times we do those. Why do we preach an unpopular message? Because the Lord is looking for people that he can share his burden with them. When Hananiah came to Nehemiah, it was not just the burden of Hananiah. It was not just the burden of the remnant in Jerusalem, it was the Lord's burden that Nehemiah all of a sudden felt the heaviness. Oh my God, what burden my Lord is carrying and suffering that no one cares about. We all care the Lord to take our burdens, but who is it that takes the burdens of the Lord? And we go to the Bible and I'll show you how the Lord is looking for burden carriers. The Lord Jesus in his famous invitation in Gospel of Matthew chapter 11 verse 28 says, Come unto me all you are who you are heavy laden and burdened. I will give you rest. That's the rest of salvation when we receive the Lord and we put our burdens down. He says heavy laden and burdened. We all come with burdens. The burden of sin, the burden of guilt, the burden of failure, all the other burdens. We come to the cross of the Lord. We see the love of Christ. We see the grace of the Lord. We dump all of those at the foot of the cross and our spirit finds rest. But the verse doesn't end there. The next verse says, and what? Carry my yoke. Come under my yoke. For my yoke is light. For I am meek and humble and you and learn from me and you shall find rest for your souls. The rest of the spirit happens at the time of salvation. But the rest of the soul happens when I share the yoke with the Lord. What's a yoke? In the old times they used to put this huge log on the neck of the cow uh, or the bull to carry the weight. He says, come under that weight. I'm carrying it. Are you willing to carry it with me? 
Paul says in Philippians chapter 3, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. What suffering was Paul referring to? What suffering? Was Paul going to share the sufferings of Christ's crucifixion? Was he going to do that? No. No one can share the sufferings of the cross. Paul wanted to suffer with the Lord for the sake of the church. Many times he says, I'm suffering for the sake of the church. So, at the conclusion, at least this part, maybe I'll share some more later. What made Nehemiah an outstanding person that the Lord, out of all the thousands of men and women that potentially, and on the surface, were even more qualified than Nehemiah to be the representative of God's end-time work, he chose a bartender, but that man carried the burden of the Lord. Today, God is asking us to carry his burden. What kind of a burden? For the church for these last hours, for the believers to be awake, to bring an awakening, to open the ears by the voice of the Spirit, to open the eyes and understanding, so there will be a people ready for the Lord. That's why Nehemiah at the end of the first chapter says, I was the wine bearer of the king of Persia. Yes, he carried a heavy burden, not his own burden, his burden. And the Lord says, good. I found myself a man that is willing to share with me in the pain and the burden that I have for my people. And today the Lord is looking for that corporate man who's willing to come under the yoke with the Lord and says, Lord, we will carry the burden with you. We will carry the pain and we will begin to intercede in these last hours. I'll tell you maybe next time if I have a chance. The coronavirus has done the greatest service as far as we are concerned because it has opened our eyes to the way the Lord wants to restore a people ready for the Lord Jesus. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord bring this awakening to us that we come under the yoke with the Lord Jesus and be that simple wine bearer. Wine is a symbol of life. Nehemiah and the king of Persia were in the business of interacting in life. We have to become so intimate and friendly with the Lord Jesus, just like a wine bear, that not only he knows us, which he does, but we know him. And Nehemiah, because he knew the king of Persia, he was able to tell him what the real problem was, and the, the king came to his help. The Lord will come to our help as well if our intentions and our goals are set on carrying the burdens with the Lord for his people in preparation for the return of the Lord Jesus. God bless you until perhaps another time we'll share some more from the book of Nehemiah.